those of you who don't know Emma, uh, head of podiatry at Plymouth University. I'm head, I'm just a lecturer. Oh God, make it done, make it done. I've always thought you were head, you just act so, so no, head. I just, I just act like it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, le- senior lecturer at Plymouth University, uh, owner of 4D Podiatry, private practice in Plymouth, uh, co- co-founder of MSK UK with Dr. Jill Halstead, um, on the uh, fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, and I believe on the on the board for that as well. Is that right? Uh, I mean, I'm a regional advisor. I'm yeah, sorry. I think department. good question. A good question to start with is, I mean, how how do you get it all done? Well, you know, when do you sleep? <laughs> sleep? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I seriously, some days I don't know. Um, I think uh, it, I'm I'm the kind of person that takes the loudest voice and listens to it. So depending on who's screaming loudest they tend to get my attention and uh, diaries have kind of saved my bacon on a few occasions because if I don't diarise stuff it just doesn't tend to happen but the other thing I would say is regarding MSK UK you know without a doubt it's a team effort Jill and I um, you know we are like conjoined twins in some respects we we don't operate without each other's say so and without each other's help so um yeah, I mean, that's just obviously in terms of the overall administration, the projects that we get involved with. But then there's the hub leads as well, who are awesome. So, yeah, it's team, full team. Oh, and you're, and you're doing a PhD too, right? As well. Yeah, yeah. Just, right, <laughs> yeah. just, to, just to, to really uh, mix it up. Um, yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to say, Craig, or should we just get stuck into the questions we've... No, uh, I, I we've just... Uh, you may not be the head of podiatry at Plymouth, but, Plymouth, but you're certainly the face of it publicly. Oh. <laughs> Which is, is probably an important task. And as far as the PhD goes, um, rule number one about PhDs is you're not allowed one unless it's ruined your life. Oh, it's totally, <laughs> yeah. Shell of my former self. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's get stuck in because they're sort, of, they're sort of on the same theme as well, the, the questions that we've had come in. Um, firstly, about the, let's go Royal, Royal College of Surgeons, uh, Physicians and Surgeons first, just because I think we'll probably... Once we start talking about your university work, we'll probably go down the road of undergrad learning yeah. and training, and that that could divert us. So let's go Royal College first. Um, a reasonable question, one that, that I'm sure you get asked a lot, is um, what what are the benefits? So if someone wants to to join, someone wants to consider being a member or a fellow, um, why would they do this? What 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 would they get? You know, uh, people want to know what they're going to get back in return. Yeah, so it's a really good question, and. I think it's a question that needs to be answered because it's not free. You, you're going to have to pay to um, either be a member or a fellow as, as these uh, memberships of colleges often uh, entail. So it's a very reasonable question. Um, I think it's quite an individual thing, which which particular um, facet appeals to people. But if I just sort of outline a few of them um, that you just get kind of thrown in regardless of uh, whether you really valued that particular thing or not. First of all, it's a multidisciplinary college. So it's the only multidisciplinary Royal Medical College, I think, not in the world, because there's a Royal, Physici- Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada, but um, certainly that embraces nurses and AHPs as well. It's the only college that um, that does that. So, uh, you know, I'll often be up there and sat around with uh, a pharmacist, a nurse, a doctor, a you know, cardiologist, um, a surgeon, a dentist, and we've all got certain amounts in common and then certain amounts that obviously are very specific to our own disciplines. But it just means that we develop a, a real collegiate environment across the um, across the board with that sort of focus on excellence. So everyone there is there because they want to do the best they can in their field. So it, it's got a culture about it. It's not elitist. And I would be really really keen to make that point it's not an elitist thing it's about almost like realizing personal potential it's the only college that you can currently take a post registration professional exam in as well so to um to gain membership of the royal college um, the preferred route now to, now is via the exam uh, we just recently had um, a few guys go through and i got a little uh, message uh, saying you know i've passed and it was just so great to hear you know when people actually really earn it and then they know that they've really improved themselves so there's that there's also a fantastic uh, library as well so there's an electronic library if you're in private practice and you don't have i don't know online bnf or you don't have access to some journals whatever you get the library in in there as well so yeah so just a few benefits it's just a really great community of people 
Perfect. Um, I'll tell you the one thing I've noticed. Uh, yeah. I'm not really one. I'm not really one for post nominals. I've never really been a fan. Like when I write to people, I often just I write my. Those, did I? <laughs> no, no, no. So that's why I thought I'd bring it up because uh, my, my experience of, of having the Royal College post nominals uh, when I put them on a letter, particularly to a doctor, to a, to a consultant, a surgeon, or even a, a sports physician, um, every single one of them who's seen it has has commented on it. And I don't think that's ever happened with BSC or MSC or, you know, some of the other ones that we've had historically, MCHS. Yeah. Um, and, and if we, you know, we're constantly in this debate, as we know online about sort of how do we grow as a profession? How do people take us seriously? How do people know that we're the go-to people? And, and, and I never thought I'd be saying this about letters after the name, but these ones seem to really carry a bit of weight do something yeah i don't know yeah i've had a real varied response if i'm honest and i've listened to um people who are either considering joining or who have joined and without a doubt it is a variable experience i'm really glad that you've had a positive one i've had a varied one as well so some um sometimes it's almost a disbelief that because it is a multidisciplinary college and the only one when a doctor looks at those letters, they almost think it can't be a medical college because since when do we let podiatrists in? <laughs> but um, <laughs> but as soon as they, uh, ha- at least we can open that conversation. And then once you open that conversation, it's a fantastic portal to get things talked about, about what podiatry is and what we do and how we specialise um, and just exactly how advanced the profession is now. Um, so, I've, like I say, I found it really an interesting thing. Sometimes it's been absolutely no, um, you know, no point having them there at all. And I've had to really almost push the conversation if I've wanted to. Um, but other times, yeah, it's been, it's been good. Cool. Uh, Craig, your, your, mm. your uh, experience with the Royal College, because like, my understanding is you don't have to be based in the UK, do you, Emma? No, there no, are, see, there are, there are we've a number of Australia that are, few, yeah, there are yeah. a number here from Australia who have, who have, have, are involved and, and, and I'm not sure so when, when, can, plan, but when, got, can they, when can they expect your application? I, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> not this year, there's like 10 days left of this year or something. Oh, so okay. A couple oh. of weeks, sorry. Um, you know, God put me on this earth to accomplish a certain number of things. <laughs> right now, I'm so far behind, I will never die. <laughs> uh, that's fair enough. I think it's not for everybody either. Um, it has to be something that we, you feel that it would really benefit you. So, yeah. Uh, we may as well go straight into undergrad then. Um, and I know, I know, I know you get this a lot and I've seen it myself both online and and at conferences where because you are the, the as Craig said the face of, of, a, <laughs> of a university it seems that anyone who has any misgivings with undergraduate education things it includes that they don't believe it should or, or things that it doesn't include that they believe it should it seems it's all your fault certainly I've, I've, I've seen uh, that and I don't want it to go to go down that road tonight but I guess where should we start let's start with current undergraduate education um the, the the main issue that people have with it i think is certainly that i've uh, read and, and heard is, is the lack of standardization perhaps across yeah. the uh, 11 12 schools uh, in in the uk um i know you probably these are your comments and not those of plymouth university but um, what, what what would your retort to that be uh, first of all i think it's happened for a long long time and it's only really since social media has happened that we've spotted it properly so it's something that I've noticed, like you say, just in the last few years, it prob- probably is something to do with social media, but it's also to do with the, I think, the maturation of the profession with evidence as well. So if for years, um, before we were, I mean, I, I'm of an age where when I graduated, evidence-based practice was not even a thing. It, we didn't know the term. It wasn't um, you know, part of our vernacular. And then suddenly it became introduced on the periphery of the profession and slowly and importantly it's become central to the profession's ethos and I think you know globally it's certainly not typical of just the UK and what that's brought with it is um, challenge because in podiatry there's a lot of practice that we inherit I, I still do a lot of stuff that I was just taught at uni um, you know why do I pie crust rather than bevel a pad for instance or something like that should I ever do that yeah it's because I was taught at uni and I haven't really questioned it since it's only when someone does a paper on edge effect and you suddenly take a look at what that actually does 
but you've got to go and look at the evidence before you even realize that there's even a question to be had. So what social media has done for me, and I think for quite a few people, has um, it's brought the questions to your doorstep. You, you, I mean, without a doubt, UK podiatry has opened my eyes to a lot of uh, issues in dermatology that I just don't normally talk about because I've got an MSK focus and I feel so much richer for it. But if you're not on social media or if you, um, I don't know, if you don't particularly um, subscribe to certain um, threads or whatever, you, you might miss stuff or you might just not particularly like the, um, the way in which things are discussed and you might just disengage from that. So I think that social media has had a big influence on, on the awareness of this being a thing. Um, students, of course, talk and uh, they compare experiences as well. And they are somewhat blind to what they might have had in another school anyway. So I don't it's not that I dismiss their point of view at all, but I'm always mindful that they don't know what they don't know because they they didn't go and train at Huddersfield. They trained at Northampton or they trained at Plymouth or wherever. So it's always a personal perspective to address the problem, though. So that is the, the problem sort of outlined to begin to address the problem. Um, we are at a stage where we've got to get consensus. And to do that, it's an exercise in itself. It's, a, it's going to be something that doesn't happen overnight. There's a few people who we would or groups of people who we would perhaps identify as stakeholders. Um, and importantly, so because, you know, the surgeons want uh, certain preparation to go into surgery. The pod med people want certain preparation to go into pod med, diabetes, MSK, whatever. So we've got to get the subspecialty groups to draw consensus statements together and arrange a sort of competency framework that people can work towards potentially and align undergraduate programs to over time. So it's not going to happen overnight, but to say people are aware of it and people are feeling very positive about doing something about it. And there are emails flying around at the moment, certainly in MSK. So that's a start. <laughs> that's good to know. That's good to know. And, uh, and on the on the subject of social media, actually, because obviously I when I trained, social media didn't exist. When Craig trained, he was you know he was chipping his homework into Slate with a with a chisel, perhaps. Um, you know, I'm guessing your, your average group of undergrads now are particularly the ones that are school leavers, 18, 19, 20. They they've grown up with a smartphone in their hand. They're on Snapchat, Instagram. Um, yeah. Is do you, do you uh, of all your years teaching and, and I guess the, the more this this generation that are more sort of tuned into that, do you think it's it's uh, what's evolving now is it going to be futures of, of generations of podiatrists that are just better critical thinkers or because they've got better access to the research or not? I'd like to hope so. The reason I'm hesitating is because there's a downside to instant access to information that sounds credible. You know, we've all seen the alternative facts um, culture that's come through and, you know, just stuff that gets through the filters and it sounds so credible and why would you even question it? It looks like it's gonna work. It looks like it's gonna benefit people. And sometimes truth isn't popular either. And sometimes people like what they know because it's comfortable. And it's something that they can cope with, maybe cognitively, academically. So it's a really uncomfortable conversation to have with some people um, who don't particularly relish um, engagement with critical thinking, because it is a skill in its own right. It's something that requires honing. It's a journey. You start maybe um, critiquing at one level, and then after five, 10 years, you're critiquing at quite another level. So it can be quite an alienating experience, I found. Um, people you know, there's a lot of talk of evidence police on social media, because when people are critiquing at a certain level, it can sound quite personally critical um, or at least be taken as personally critical. And often that's not the case at all. It's, it's just the intention is to critique the argument rather than the person. But I would hope that the degree prepares and increasingly prepares people to be critical and just to learn to put arguments on the table and to know that it's not the person that they're that is being criticized not the person who wrote it the person who likes it it's just the argument that's on the table and that should in its own right be safe to critique but there are ways of doing it hmm. yeah it's a it's a it's a double-edged sword social media when it comes to that it's, it's more hmm. access but it's also more access to the wrong stuff um now just before we went live tonight the, the three of us were having a little chat and i was really impressed when him commented that with her second year students, she was actually getting them to 
critique uh, Facebook and Facebook comments or Facebook pages um, with the Facebook page here, but then next to them, the list of logical fallacies. So I want you, can you explain that a bit more, Emma? Because I think that's great. That's the kind of critical thinking that those with a degree should have that I, I sometimes question. <laughs> yeah, so the logical fallacies are something that I've only been probably aware of formally in the last, I don't know, five years, three to five years, something like that. And in themselves, they require some learning, you know, to actually find out what they are and what they're about. And it's things like attacking the person and the character of the person rather than the argument that they're making or you know, saying, surely no true Scotsman would say that and, and critiquing the, the nature of the perception of that person. Sorry, my cat's just jumped up next to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> gosh, Facebook and cats, eh? Um, anyway, uh, so to become familiar with the, the way that an argument can be made and the faults in a particular argument is in itself a challenge and a skill in its own right. And I think the more we practice it and practice it gently with each other, the, the better we'll get at it. So if you do that with, I don't know, some paper from getting posture in front of you that is full of complex statistics and concepts that the first, second or third years haven't come across yet, they've got two problems on their hand then. They've got to even understand the words on the paper and how to go about critiquing that paper. So I figured that doing it with a less challenging medium uh, would be a good start. So social media where that's often where they hang out, often where they're taking in and absorbing when their barriers are down, absorbing information to actually sit there and just be chugging over with a critical mind is a habit I want them to get into. I want us all to get into it. And I'm just as guilty as anyone of having those lulls at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or just absent minded glances at Facebook or Twitter or something. And you let something into your mind and you don't even realize you've done it until someone picks you up on it later so just even to practice gently critiquing with each other and making it just part of our culture i think it's going to be a really important shift yeah. over the next few years i read i read a really uh, i read a really great uh sort of post uh on april the 2nd from a from a, one of the critical thinking facebook pages i follow and it basically said the way when we wake up on april the 1st a bit guarded and we pick up the newspaper and everything we read, we sort of read with that, that skeptical view that is someone, you know, I'm not going to believe this until, and, and, until I'm shown otherwise. And it suggested everything you ever read, treat it like it's April the 1st. Uh, and I think that's yeah. quite a nice way to, to and it's exhausting as you, as you know, <laughs> um, but it's not, not a terrible way to live your life, is it? I think that's been, I think, one of my say quite legitimate gripes about undergraduate programs is that if you look at not not specifically the, the podiatry content or podiatry courses but if you look at the generic attributes that universities say that people that come out of this university with a degree will have these attributes so they're generic and almost always in there is the words critical thinking and, and they've been there for a very very long time and I think on average I don't think the degree programs are achieving that because I look at a lot of social media comments and roll my eyes and say, do you really have a degree from university? You're supposed to have these critical thinking skills. And I, 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 there's a, and I, and I just love what you're doing there, Emma, with using Facebook rather than gate and posture <laughs> um, to try and develop those skills. Um, <laughs> well, you know, no, I, I, yeah, you, you know what I mean. You know, so I, I, I do have an issue with, with that, the development of those, those skills because I think they've just – yeah, you know, and, and, and as recently as the last few years, those skills have become extraordinarily more important. <laughs> yeah. You know, the hashtag it's fake so news, more, hashtag. Yeah, exactly. There's there's more volume of information, and people can shout louder through social media as well. Everyone's got their broadcasting mm. platform and their megaphone, and some people are very very good at presenting themselves as well. They're, mm. they're very confident and they're very articulate and, and whatever. And it's just like you say, it's just about waking up with that April the first. Uh, mindset really mm. yeah. okay. okay we're on with 23 minutes in you got any more questions in has frozen okay, That's 23 uh, minutes already where did that time go with, I know, time, oh, time goes quickly um, it does I should just note that this is not alcoholic. You saw me take a sip. It's actually just like non-alcoholic punch, but it's Christmas, so I thought. Yeah, okay, well, I, mine's non-alcoholic too, but it's <laughs> seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay, back your mute button's on, Ian. 
I'm back in. Okay. Apologies for that. Back. Apologies. There he is. <laughs> yep. I was gone. Any other questions there, Ian? <clears throat> Uh, did I miss anything? I've, I, have you? There's been a few things that have come through while uh, while we've been talking. Shall I go through the Facebook comments? Yeah. Uh, and, unless you have already, have you? There's one. Well, Rob, Robert Isaacs is being hilarious as he always is, and that's that's you know that's what he does. <laughs> Kevin Kirby's on, and he said hello and hi to Emma. Hi, Kevin. And he mentioned he's mentioned that when he was when he went to school. What does this say? Something along the lines of driving to the library in a Flintstone cart. No, not really. He used to have, he's, he's mentioning um, about how he had to physically copy book uh, chapters at the copy, at the photocopy in the library. And I've, I've read something about, I've read him say this before on things like Podiatry Arena when, when a student asks, uh, can someone send me a paper? And, and you know, a frustration that in his day he had to physically get a paper copy and now that it's all online and some some students still that was in my day too Ian, I had actually, three panels as a child yeah, on the well, television mine actually. <laughs> <laughs> actually my yeah, day my too in fairness. Yeah, my day. <laughs> uh, he's actually got a question as well um where where would podiatry be in 2017 without the contributions which have been made online with uh, pr initially the JISC mail base and more more recently Podiatry Arena, do we feel these mm. online podiatric educational websites have been positive or negative in, in the difference they've made? Gosh, yeah, JISC mail, that's taking me back. That's where it all started, isn't it? Yeah. The JISC mail and yeah. then over to Pod Arena and then Facebook and Twitter boomed, didn't they? And, and it's diversified, yeah. really. I, I'd say well, it's going to be a typical diplomatic answer. There's been positives and negatives. And the positives have been the availability and the, the voice, the platform that everybody has, the, the opportunity to chat when you're, you can chat with somebody over in America or Australia when you're sitting in, in the UK. I mean, that's just, yeah. that's never happened in our history. Um, so without a doubt, that has been a good thing. And the networks that have, involved, have evolved from that are just, you know, mm -hmm. again, self-evident. Um, the bad things, I would say, based on feedback that I've heard, are the have said the word evidence police already. It's kind of the way I think sometimes we feel very safe with our keyboards and we type, and maybe we don't always realise how we're coming across, or maybe people are a little sensitive when they read stuff, and and there is that difficulty um, before emojis existed, especially in how things were taken, and there's been no. It's only no secret to say there's been a few spats on uh, these forums over the years. Overwhelming though, I would overwhelmingly though, I would say it's been hugely positive, hugely positive. And the the questions it raises are as helpful as the answers that you get along the way. So yeah, I think it's good. You yeah, know, I think it's brought out the worst and the the best in people. It's, it's brought out the networks. It's brought out the dissemination of information. But it's also brought out the lack of critical thinking skills, and in some cases, yeah. bad behaviours. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a, again double-edged sword. But I can't imagine going anywhere without it. No, it's it's changed the way that we operate, hasn't it? We just yeah. I don't know how we do it now. I'd feel yeah. so cut off without it. I'm an addict. I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first step. Um, yeah. <laughs> what other questions have we got? Hello to Ian Riley. Atoll's watching from. Middle East. This is cool, actually, uh, wow. seeing who's online. I like this new thing. So, um, can we talk a bit about your PhD, Emma? I know obviously there are going to be sensitive parts you you, you are privy to talk about, but um, one of the questions actually Kylie uh, Williams asked was was uh, what are you researching, and um, what what what's your your sort of aspiration of its clinical applicability? Okay, so here's my three minute thesis. It's always well practiced by any uh, PhD student. I'm in my write up <laughs> year now, so hopefully I do have some sort of sense to to make uh, when I talk about it. Um, it started off with me um, just being curious with, about foot posture back along. That's what I was interested in. Things have happened since then. Your own paper and, and so on has, has come out and enlightened us about baseline foot posture and its influence on or lack of influence on um, pathology and injury and um, pain but for me there was still a missing piece of the jigsaw and that was the change that happens during use of the foot so measuring it statically unfatigued is one thing measuring it during movement and during fatiguing this fatiguing process and then again at the end of that fatiguing process was something that at that point hadn't been done so I started off by doing exactly that I did a study on um, looking at the changes in foot posture I asked the question about what the mechanisms might be that contributed to a drop in arch height after a long run, after a half marathon, and tested those in a lab. 
And so I was looking at things like strength and inverter stiffness um, and uh, perceived rate of exertion and things like that. Um, and I had some secondary outcome measures as well, looking at um, uh, plant pressures and uh, 3D kinematics. So I developed a little in-shoe kinematic model using uh, code of motion and um, plant pressures as well. So it's all part of your day job when you're doing this kind of thing is developing new technology. Um, then I wanted to see if I could influence one of the things I thought might be uh, the mechanism behind the foot posture change. Um, so I developed a, a piece of technology that goes on an insole, did a randomized control trial, checked if, if I could control or, or influence that factor. Um, and the, the reason I did all of this is because, like I said, I think there's this sort of almost hidden world um, in time that we don't necessarily consider. We're very static in the way that we, I say static, we're stuck in time when we assess in the clinic. So it was always a bugbear of mine that, for example, we do an assessment in barefoot and then the patient wanders out of the clinic in shoes. Well, how applicable is that assessment that we've just done barefoot to the shod condition? So that's where I started. That was actually my master's where I started up with high heels. And it's gone from there. My thought process has gone from there, this hidden world of the foot and, uh, and how it operates in time. Is that three minutes? Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> Spot on, spot on. Um, and uh, going to be going to be. This is going to be published uh, in places so that people can read it in in sections or. Yeah, in one I've big already bit. published from it. Uh, I've published my half marathon study a few years ago. Now I've done some conferences. So there's some conference proceedings around. Uh, certainly from the first study. Um, as with all part time PhDs, like you said, when you are somewhat under the uh, the kibosh from lots and lots of voices, it, there's inevitably a delay in things coming out. So you'll have to bear with me, but. Without a doubt, the thumb screws are on this year. It will all be at least um, submitted as a big thesis and then hopefully um, published piecemeal and uh, presented at conferences as well. So, yeah. Watch actually, actually, we've just had a question from Chris McLean in Canada. Hey, Chris. Oh, great. Hi, Chris. And Chris has just says, um, how do you measure and quantify fatigue? OK, so it's exercise induced fatigue. And we looked at um, using a proxy measure of that. I didn't do lactate levels or VO2 max or anything. I used um, perceived exertion, rate of exertion, so the Borg scale. Um, and the reason I did that, it has been correlated to um, to heart rate. So it was a, it's a secondary outcome measure. It wasn't something I was particularly um, overly interested in being too precise about. I wanted them to judge themselves how they fatigued and how they felt they were fatiguing. And the idea behind the um, behind getting that subjective um, feedback from them and also getting in time, real time in shoe uh, plant pressures and kinematic changes. I could see when the foot changed, um, the way it moved and made, or the way um, that the plant pressures were being put down underneath the foot and see if that correlated to their sense of um, fatigue as well. Another question about it, Emma, actually from uh, Ian Riley, who as you know, is one of these uh, foot carpenters based in Northampton. <laughs> Hello, Ian. And uh, he says, how do you how do you guys, I think he's talking to you and Craig, actually, how do you guys who understand function help us simple surgeons do the best uh, operations, bunions, for example? Oh, Ian, I'm going to throw this straight back at you because this is infographics and you know it. <laughs> and you are the infographics <laughs> king. <laughs> right, he's too, he's too humble, I think. Actually, mate, that, that question could be the topic of a whole live stream next year. But let's, yeah, yeah it's, it's a big topic. So let's hold that one over to next year. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll, that's a topic that we should, because we've been dabbling with the idea of having four people on yeah. for a little while. And we're not too sure whether it would be too noisy and too messy. But maybe if we are going to have that topic, we get a surgeon on as well. Maybe Ian himself, if he fancies it. I know he's got a bit of a face for radio, but I think we could convince him. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we could. Oh, you, you know, it's the um, actual question that matters more than anything, isn't it? It's translational medicine, translational evidence, yeah. getting it in practice. And we know there's a lag and also there's interpretation and who's checking how it's being interpreted as well. So it's a really, really good question. And yeah, it deserves some airspace. Yeah, perfect. Um, you're, you're renowned for this is my question, actually. This hasn't just come in. This is me. You're renowned for uh, I think it's fair to say having read a paper or two uh, in your time. You know, you're pretty uh, on the ball, pretty up to speed. Uh, 2017, you know, we're, we're pretty much at the end of it now. Best paper of this year for you? When you that say best, you, you mean most notorious? Oh, fa favourite, favourite? <laughs> favourite paper. <laughs> oh, I, it's obvious, but I'm going to say it. It was the Jarvis paper. 
just because yeah, yeah. it's finally um, drawn the line in the sand um, on a, a huge subculture in podiatry. And I've had more, I know, you know, this is only me, never mind what Chris and Hannah and, and the group have had to um, probably encounter and debate as well, but I've had more questions about it. I've done journal clubs on it. I've done CPD events on it and watched people say, effectively say, don't take it away from me, give me something else. So the reason I like the paper is because it fundamentally challenged what we do and why we do it. I, I thought it also left us with some really good questions about, and so what next, what do we put in its place? And that's the, the challenge for us in the next year, maybe 2018. Mm. And, and following on from that, you're also renowned for, you know, being, being at a conference or, or three uh, over the, the conference season. And you've been to several this year, particularly the ones I've got in mind are obviously the Firefly Symposium uh, and also Osgo Live, both of which mm. I, I, I was at Firefly. I wasn't at Osgo, but I saw a lot of it on social media. And it seems to me they were very similar in their delivery and also very, very different the two of them to the, the historic conference model. So as a, as a seasoned conference goer, do you think Firefly Osgo, you know, that's the, the future of conferencing? Oh, podiatry got cool, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and I, I would say that if I'm going to be fair, Osgo um, Live I went to in 2016, and that was also very good. And the Firefly Symposium uh, the year before that was also very good. I, I, I Without a doubt, people want a different way now. There's they're bringing the social media culture into the conference center now. So they don't want just to be talked at and presented at, they want that interaction time. So both of those two conferences this year definitely um, dished up some really good talks, but then also time to go and digest it all together. And that was the, the beauty of them. It was the networking time, the chatting time, the, the stuff that you normally do in the bar late at night was actually done at a civilised hour without the influence of alcohol. So it was really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that's interesting in that it, there's certainly been a number of discussions in recent years about the future of the big conference, um, especially given the role that social media now plays in conferences and has been embraced by some conferences such as those two and not embraced by others. So, yeah, that's, it's a ongoing conversation about the future of those big annual conferences um, for that for that reason. Um, and the delegates there were very different because it, they're not academic meetings primarily. They're not there to showcase research. They're there to, um, to yes, I suppose, to have that translational um, conversation. So there is research, but there's also the, the time needed to sort of integrate that into conversation as well. Yeah, they're a different type of conference. Um, we, we have had just had another question from Kevin Kirby, but I'm oh, sorry, Kevin, I think we're going to have to hold that one over because we're running short on time. But the question was asking Emma, how much of the root type measurements do you still use in your practice? And what do you think of the future of the root type biomechanics theory in the UK? And then I, I think we could do a whole live stream on that. And, and my suggestion to Ian is maybe we try and get Hannah on next year and pursue this the, the, the idea rather than... Uh, address it now i can answer very quickly oh. if that would be helpful okay sure yeah, ian's just frozen again so yeah emma if you can answer that okay well while ian's defrosting um i don't do uh anything like the neutral calcaneal stance position i do relax i suppose just because resting calcaneal stance position is how people stand so you could argue that that's still routine um i don't do passive um open chain ankle joint dorsiflexion but i do use that test for stiffness evaluation um, rather than for range so i would say that i and i definitely still describe foot type so i still describe a four for invertus or a four for evertus because they're helpful to use but i don't subscribe to the compensation mechanisms in quite the way that perhaps i was trained to do 25 years ago yeah no i think i'd be pretty similar to that um ian has still frozen <laughs> um, yeah, look, okay, so, so someone's actually just, uh, oh, and someone's posted it. Oh, Ian's posted it. Yes, a couple of people have asked for a link to the Jarvis paper. I'm a little bit surprised they um, don't have it, but Ian has posted a link below now for those who are looking for it. Um, now, unfortunately, I'm not privy to the questions that Ian had for you, <laughs> Emma, um, and why he's frozen. I'm not quite sure. What we well, it's perhaps worth mentioning just as we're yeah. um, on that subject that yeah. there was a, a videoed Royal College, seeing as we've talked about the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons yeah. of Glasgow, they have a journal club. It's one of the biggest positives that I could say about yeah. the college myself. And one of the journal clubs was on that 
on that paper. Sure. And it's on YouTube. You can go and Google their channel and, um, and okay. have a listen. Okay, Ian's back now. We just we just carry on discussing things Ian, while you're frozen. But you got any last questions for Emma? Because we're at almost at forty minutes now. We <laughs> I have, sorry, I think I think I've got some sort of dodgy internet this evening. Apologies. Uh, you, I presume you just I just missed Kevin's question today. Is that the one? Yes, you yeah, br- briefly answered it, but I suggested that we devote a whole live stream to that next year, and perhaps we try and get Hannah on. Yeah, if she's willing to. If we've been on it. for four. If, if we've been on for forty minutes, now's not the time to get into root theory. Isn't it, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> not really. Uh, like, I just. I just posted the link while I was yeah, we on saw my phone. That, yeah. <laughs> paper. Uh, anything else? Uh, oh, last question. George. Uh, hello, George. Any research on foot posture change in related to increased muscle tone? Yes. yes. Well, I don't know about tone, actually, but certainly EMG change. So there's been some work, uh, a lot of work coming out of Australia on this at the moment. Um, there's quite a few. I think George Murley is one of the biggest contributors mm. in that field. Um, yeah. Definitely. No, there, there, is, in no, there, there is there is one study on muscle tone and arch height and found no relationship. And there's a few others. I'll, I'll link to them below later. And there is a couple of studies on muscle strength and arch height. And again, generally no relationship. Um, but the one on muscle tone, no relationship to arch height, which is probably foot posture. So, yeah, I can't remember the author. Sorry, I will look it up. We'll stick it in the comments uh, afterwards like we try to. Um, and also, Emma, if, if, if it's not too much trouble, you know, you said you published a couple of, of bits of work from your PhD. Um, yeah. Could you pop links to those in the comments for if anyone's yeah, interested? Sure. Um, I had myself in, on that list as well. Um, that's all the questions from online. Um, from what I can see. Yep, that's it. That's our lot. Okay, well, look, I, I think we'll wind up there. Thanks so much, Emma, for joining us. Thanks um, for you for having me. It's been really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this this <laughs> probably will be our we last. We haven't addressed the elephant in the room, which is it's Friday night and we, we all had nothing. <laughs> we all have no life. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, it's, yeah, it's Saturday morning for me. Um, yeah. Just for those who have joined late, if you come back to Facebook in about 10, 15 minutes, they, they render the video and the whole thing will be available from the start. Um, I don't think Ian and I will be doing another one of these this year, but we will be back next year with a bigger and better format. Um, we're exploring a whole lot of options. So any ideas for guests, um, we're certainly welcome, open to lots of suggestions. Um, and, and thanks to everyone for the feedback. I mean, it's been really, really good. We've hardly had anything negative said about what we've been doing. So that, that's great. So um, thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Emma. Uh, do you want to say anything, Ian? <laughs> no, just thanks, thanks to Emma. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone. And uh uh, there's a there's a little vote on on my Facebook page, the Sports Podiatry Info Facebook page, about uh, naming this because we want to sort of give it its own Facebook page at some point. So if you don't mind heading over there and and not just having a vote, the vote really only gave us two options. But if you've got any good ideas, uh, banterous ones are of course welcome. Um, there's been a couple of amusing ones. Just <laughs> pop them in the comments, and um, yeah, that would be that would be much appreciated as well. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone.